thanks very much for the uh, invitation. It's a real pleasure, uh, as always, to be, uh, to be in uh, Tron time. And I'll, I'll start with a disclaimer. Is that I'm an epidemiologist. So you've had world-leading geneticists talking about uh, difficult uh, um, and real science. So this is now a sort of decline towards the end of the day to, uh, <laughs> to, to epidemiology. And uh, my interest in genetics uh, was exclusively uh, in relation to how genetics can improve identification of modifiable causes of disease. You can actually influence population health. So not, uh, my interest is not in gene discovery. It's more in utilizing um, uh, genetic variants that have been discovered. And this is sort of focused at causation at a group level. It's saying, what can you actually say about things which would influence population health? It's not about using genes for precision medicine or personalized medicine. So that's my uh, disclaimer. So if you're interested in modifiable causes, then why don't you just st uh, study the modifiable causes themselves? Why do you need to use genetic variants? Well, I think uh, we, we all know the, uh, the stories which come like this. Eating an egg a day can raise the risk of developing diabetes. And then a couple of days later, you open the newspaper and it says, eat eggs to beat diabetes. Four a week can slash risk by 40%. So actually, Actually, if you, if you eat a dozen a week, then you'd actually be immortal. Well, well you wouldn't develop, you wouldn't develop um, di diabetes. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you've, or most of you have seen this cartoon, this American cartoon before. This is the newsreader says, according to a report released today, and he presses the button and these spin round and with coffee causes depression in twins. Uh, and then, you know, that this, this week's uh, or today's scare. All of these, are, of course, not causal except red wine does cause sexual dysfunction in men aged 25 to 40, <laughs> although that is a very distant memory for me, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so, 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 and then we had some lovely examples of how, you know, confounding by indication, you know, here, you, with, you know, with lifestyle factors like egg eating, you get the confounded by social position, by, you know, health status, by other behaviors. Uh, we had these lovely examples from, uh, from Boris about confounding by indication when studying uh, pharmaco, uh, pharma, side effects of, of drugs. So the same thing applies there. Um, so in Mendelian randomization is a rather straightforward idea. It is that your germline genetic variants don't uh, change from when, uh, from when you get them at, uh, conce at conception. Uh, and therefore, the disease process itself can't influence your germline genetic variants. But for most risk factors that one studies, modifiable risk factors, the disease process might be influencing the risk factor rather than the other way around. And that if you have a genotype that can proxy for some modifiable risk factor, then there won't be the confounding of that genotype. The genotype won't be confounded by social position, by dietary behavior, by physical activity, uh, etc. cetera, that uh, your, your standard risk factors are, are horrendously confounded by those uh, factors. So you escape both reverse cause uh, and confounding. And uh, uh, technically, the genetic variants can be considered as instruments within what economists uh, uh, call in instrumental variables framework. And to be an instrument or an instrumental variable, the genetic variant needs to be independent of confounders. The genetic variant must be associated with the exposure, so it's LDL cholesterol level you're interested in. Your genetic variant must be associated with that. But the genetic variant must be independent of the outcome, conditional on the exposure and confounders. So, the, so it mustn't have any direct effect on the outcome, which isn't through the modifiable exposure you're interested in. Now, only the second of these can actually be established. The other two are assumption driven, and therefore you need to test them through sensitivity analyses. So here's a really simple uh, schema of an in in instrumental variable analysis, looking at, say, a modifiable exposure, say, C-reactive protein levels. It's a, a circulating acute phase reactant. If you smoke, it goes up. If you get sick, it goes up. Uh, atheromas, being an inflammatory disease, puts it up. So unsurprisingly, CRP uh, is, a, is a predictor of coronary heart disease. And if you adjust for all the confounders in conventional statistical ways, it always remains a predictor of coronary heart disease. And some years ago was considered a candidate as being a potential causal factor that uh, could actually be pharma, pharmacotherapeutically manipulated. But, but so there's confounding and reverse causation in the link between CRP and coronary heart disease in an observational study, which you can't exclude and you can't statistically adjust for. 
but your, uh, your genetic variant, say a, a SNP in the promoter region of the CRP gene, which is related to uh, CRP levels at a, at a group level, if you group people by genotype, you get groups with very robust differences uh, in CRP level. Um, then you use that, the, the genetic variance as an instrument for the modifiable exposure. And if the modifiable exposure causes the outcome, the genetic variant should be associated um, with the outcome. And then uh, by combining the um, association of the genetic variant with your exposure and the genetic variant with the outcome, you can calculate or estimate the causal effect between the modifiable exposure and the outcome and obtain precision estimation uh, around that. So, uh, so I gave the example of CRP. So let's consider three uh, biomarkers which are uh, related to, uh, to the acute phase, C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and fibrinogen. And these, these are the two pairways, these are the, sorry, the pairways association, the three pairways association of those factors. This is CRP and interleukin-6. This is interleukin-6 and fibrinogen. This is CRP and fibrinogen. They're, they're very heavily associated with each other. Uh, and then these are the associations with coronary heart disease. They all predict coronary heart disease. You bang them all into a model. CRP tends to be the stronger uh, effect and, and, and tends to be robust to adjustment for the others, uh, more robust. And this is why CRP was considered the candidate causal factor through conventional or observational studies. Now, so this is a very large uh, consortium, C-reactive protein uh, MR consortium that uh, reported on uh, putting together a very large number of studies relating CRP, the genetic variant related to CRP levels to coronary heart disease and confounders. So firstly, you always need to test whether uh, the world is round, i.e. whether the genetic variants are not associated with the confounders. The genetic variant does associate with CRP very strongly, or, you know, statistically very strongly, very robustly, but it's unrelated to any of these confounders. If, uh, and there's some not here that we studied about 100 confounders. It's not related to any more than you'd expect purely by statistical fluctuation. So if you divide people up by their genotype groups, then you have groups that differ by CRP level and they differ by CRP level over their lifetime, but do not differ by any of the confounding factors. Now, uh, what one sees, if you just look at the lower part here, is this is the observational associations in all the studies that were put together in this consortium. CRP predicts coronary heart disease. You adjust for the confounders. The effect is attenuated a bit, but remains uh, statistically highly robust. However, the instrumental variable estimate using the CRP variant uh, suggests there's no causal effect of CRP uh, on coronary heart disease. Similarly, there's no suggestion of a causal effect of fibrinogen on coronary heart disease, but the interleukin-6, which actually upregulates CRP, the evidence in the Mendelian randomization studies suggests that that may be causal, and these ongoing trials are, uh, bl are blocking the IL-6 uh, receptor, are studying whether this uh, will have benefit on coronary heart disease in the secondary prevention setting. Uh, Mendelian randomization can, can be done in situations where it's just it's basically impossible to do randomized controlled trials. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, this, is, this is the example of the very strong and uh, utterly consistent uh, inverse association between body mass index and lung cancer. You simply can't be too fat to have a lower risk of lung cancer. And the, w, uh, the World Cancer Research Fund says that bo uh, low body fatnesses are classified as a possible cause of lung cancer, i.e. Uh, something that actually increases your risk. But the Mendelian randomization studies suggest that this is not uh, causal. It's more likely to be that uh, low weight reflects the damaging effects of uh, smoking before you develop uh, lung cancer. And uh, our old friend CRP, which predicts everything, if you find any outcome that isn't predicted by CRP, then it is random. It's a random outcome. Uh, uh, like winning the lottery. Uh, actually, probably because people who buy the lottery tickets, you probably find there's a positive association between CRP and winning the lottery. So even if it's random, you might get associations. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, our old friend CRP is associated strongly with lung cancer risk, but is not causal in that regard. So Mendelian randomization could be compared to randomized controlled trial. This is, a, this is a real randomized controlled trial that costs $114 million. This was the SELECT trial, which randomized people to selenium 
to reduce the risk of prostate cancer because a, a whole stack of epidemiological studies suggested that selenium protected against prostate cancer. So you randomise people, you randomise men, uh, that's the first thing, and then you uh, are, to, are given a supplement which increased the selenium by this amount, which with my fading eyesight I can't read, but anyway, by that amount. And over the long follow-up of the trial, there was uh, sadly no reduction in prostate cancer risk. There's nine genetic variants that are known to be associated with selenium. This is just illustrating one of them. Uh, similarly to the randomization, this is randomization by your god. Uh, then uh, she, she throws the dice. Um, uh, and, and then the genotypes are associated with a, obviously a different level of selenium. And you can scale it up to the same difference as you see in the trial. We use nine genetic variants, combine them uh, uh, in, in this study. Uh, and what, this, what the Mendelian randomization suggests is no effect on prostate cancer. My guess is that if these data had been available, I'm, I, I wonder whether anyone would have spent $114 million on carrying out that, that, that trial. Uh, there, there's a suggestion from the selenium trials of actually an increased risk of diabetes, and there's uh, another trial uh, as well as SELECT suggested this, and the MR studies uh, are very uh, imprecise in this regard, but suggest that there, there might be a small adverse effect of, of, on, um, on type 2 diabetes of selenium. So there's many examples of both discouraging intervention development through Mendelian randomization, like with uh, C-reactive protein, through to interventions that have just been tested in like one-year trials, like PCSK9 that we heard of, uh, and uh, Zetamib, which targets neiman pick uh, protein. You can interrogate the effects of particular targets versus downstream phenotype, and I'll, fin I'll, I'll finish by coming back to this issue, and look at on-target downstream phenotypic effects versus off-target effects, and I'll talk about that. Uh, you can predict generalizability of treatment responses. You, you, it's, you know, statins are probably the most trialed drug with long follow-up they'll ever be or ever has been. Uh, but even there, the, you know, you, uh, even there, people always say, oh, some subgroups of the population. You see these stupid stories saying, you know, old folk don't benefit. It's just not true. You know, that the, you know, women under 37 and a half years old who have got F high cholesterol don't benefit or whatever. You know, you can't test these, you can't test these subgroups. In, you can't test the drugs in trials in every subgroup, but you can look at the genetic variants against outcomes in every subgroup to get some ever suggestion about whether the effects are the same. The effects of uh, the HMG co-reductase variant related to lower cholesterol level, which is, mimics statins. Even in 90-year-olds, it's related to lower mortality. A paper was recently published demonstrating that. So don't believe any of the nonsense you hear about uh, low cholesterol is bad for you when you're old. Uh, it's, not, it's not true. Uh, and you can predict factorial pharmaceutical effects, which uh, I've just taken the slides out from that, so I won't be showing anything on factorial effects. Um, this, is a this is a study that my uh, colleague um, Michael Holmes did, which was looking uh, at um, uh, uh, drugs or predicting the effects of drugs which lowered secret secretory phospholipase A2. This is, again, an acute phase reactant. It predicts coronary heart disease. You adjust for everything. It still predicts coronary heart disease. Large amounts of money were invested in trials of this drug. Perhaps before doing that, people should have studied the effects of genetic variants related to difference in level of this factor, which were completely unrelated to uh, outcome. And the trials, this is, this is a, the first small trial that disastrously went wrong. All two more trials have since estimated risks of 1.00 for uh, manipulating this at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. And these things have real effects. Is the GSK's when a uh, 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 drug failed in this regard, and this is their share price. And this is an instrumental variable analysis showing that there is insider dealing in share prices because the trial was officially announced then. And yet people are offloading their shares. Some people are in the know. These, think, these things are not meant to be known, but people were dumping their shares in advance of the trial being, uh, the trial being released. I'm really sorry to be the, have to bring you the shocking news of the fact that people are corrupt uh, when it comes to dealing in shares. I know, probably not in Norway. Sorry, I, I realize that, sorry. Uh, so uh, uh, Mendelian randomization studies would certainly have curbed enthusiasm for raising circulating HDL cholesterol level for lipoprotein-associated phospholipase A2 and for secretory phospholipase A2. And I don't think, to, with the evidence, people would necessarily launch trials in that regard. So we all know that uh, GWAS is now officially a religion, as has been recognized by the US government uh, as a religion. 
Uh, and the followers of this religion are looking forward to what they call the rapture, which is a time when GWAS will lead to the discovery of new drug targets and everybody in the church will become billionaires. So that's why, of course, uh, we're here. There are many problems in interpreting Mendelian randomization findings and limitations, which I'm now going to go through. So this is the good news, the upbeat part of the talk. Now I'll go downbeat a bit, and then I'll finish on the upbeat, is the idea. Uh, firstly, uh, you know, uh, the data are generally from GWASs of disease incidence, not progression. And so these do not tell you anything, give you no direct evidence about treatment. They tell you about prevention. I think we've been seriously misled by coronary heart disease, which is one of the few diseases, I think, where the same factors which trigger your first heart attack, if you lower them, they reduce your risk of secondary disease. Cholesterol lowering after a heart attack, blood pressure lowering, stopping smoking, they are good for you even after you've had a heart attack. But think of something like lung cancer. You know, the, the GWAS is for lung cancer. The top hit is CHRNA5, a nicotine receptor variant related to smoking. Once you've got lung cancer, stopping smoking doesn't do you any good. And if you think of you know, a lot of autoimmune diseases, things tr triggered by infections, then once the, once the disease has been triggered, Doing anything, uh, you know, targeting that process is unlikely to be beneficial. You know, we did a Mendelian randomization uh, study which does suggest that vitamin D levels are, are associated and potentially causally with lower risk of multiple sclerosis. But that says nothing about treating people once they've developed MS with vitamin D levels. It's probably, it probably relates to how people respond to EBV infection they acquire uh, soon after puberty. And once that's, that's happened, and that process has been triggered, treating those, many of those processes isn't going to do any good. So what we really need are large clinical cohorts of progression and prognosis of disease with GWAS data, rather than just GWASs of cases and controls, which could be constructed from linking biosamples to routine data sources. So the limitations of Mendelian randomization. So clearly pleiotropy is the most, is an input, most important limitation that we raised, which is that the genetic variants are having other effects than the one you're interested in. Now, when you have monomorphic proteins like C-reactive protein and you've got a, a genetic variant in the promoter region of it, you sort of think, well, it's likely that this, is a, what, you know, this main effect is through C-reactive protein levels. But when you've got anonymous variants, as you, of, you know, often have, you don't really know what they do, it's difficult uh, to, be, to be sure of that. I think there's two things that need to be borne in mind. One is that you need to think about the different categories of pleiotropy, because often you just see studies criticised as saying, you know, the pleiotropy is, a, uh, is an issue. But, the, 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 but uh, going back to Grunenberg, there was, you know, he, he categorised two different types. He called it spurious and genuine. And spurious pleiotropy, or otherwise called vertical, type 2, mediated, relational, I like mediated, is, is where your gene has, a, has an immediate effect and then that has downstream effects. So, you know, genetic variant related to IL-6 levels, of course, it relates to CRP levels. If you inject IL-6 into mice, the CRP goes up. You know, IL-6 regulates CRP. Now, that is often, those sort of things are often referred to as pleiotropy. You know, you see people referring to FTO has pleiotropic effects on, you know, blood pressure, type 2 um, uh, diabetes. You know, it would have a... a, a pleiotropic effect on wearing a belt, a large belt, you know, because those things are actually in induced by the effects on BMI. And you can show that with, you know, the 97 BMI variants, there's no particular effect of FTO on, on, on you know, blood pressure, for example, that, that is not just what you expect for its effect on, on uh, BMI. So this is, not only is this not a problem for Mendelian randomization, this is the very essence of Mendelian randomization. It uses precisely those mediated effects to actually tell you something about the, about the causal chain uh, initiated by the, by the, by the uh, primary phenotype related to the variant. So it's only horizontal or biological uh, pleiotropy where you're actually having two effects of a genetic variant which are not through uh, a same pathway. Uh, that, 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 that is the problem for, um, for Mendelian randomization. There's a lovely review I'd recommend to anyone by uh, Wagner, uh, Nature Reviews Genetics 2011, which, which you know, weighs up the, the balance between um, mediated and biological pleiotropy as it relates in model organisms and comes up, comes up with the unsurprising suggestion that once you get very large sample sizes, the you know, uh, mediated pleiotropy is, you know, is, is, is dominant. But clearly there are a lot, exam lot, many examples of horizontal or biological pleiotropy. So you can interrogate this by looking at multiple genetic variants 
and instruments because if you have genetic variants that work on different pathways to the same phenotype and they're in different genes on different chromosomes etc uh, uh, to all lead to the same spurious result they would have to have perfectly balancing biological pleiotropic effects horizontal pleiotropic effects which perfectly balance out their effect on the uh, on the phenotype of interest so here's uh, nine Variants related to LDL cholesterol level. This is the uh, PCSK9 variant associated with considerable, considerable reductions in LDL cholesterol. Here's HMG CoA reductase. Here's the LDL receptor variant, etc. This is how much they're related to lower LDL cholesterol, and this is the reduction in coronary heart disease risk associated with carrying the variants. If I was making up data, I wouldn't make it. You wouldn't make it look this good because you, 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 you know, it looks suspiciously good. But this is actually what you this is what you see with the data. And the only way you could get this through with, without cholesterol LDL cholesterol influence in coronary heart disease risk is if each of these variants had perfectly balancing pleiotropy. In completely, they're all different genes, different pathways, but somehow they get perfectly balancing pleiotropy. As you get larger and larger numbers of variants, you end up with just two hypotheses. One is that you the factor of interest, in this case LDL cholesterol, is causal with respect to your outcome. And the second one is that God exists and her main interest is fooling you by, by generating perfectly balancing <laughs> pleiotropy across a very large number of genetic variants. The second, there's now a variety, I'm going to, I'm going to go quite quickly through this because this is because uh, uh, I don't want to see, see expressions of failure to understand, it would depress me. But there's a, now, now a, a wide range of sensitivity analyses which actually allow the testing or the relaxing of the assumptions about pleiotropy. One of them we developed from a method we'd introduced in 1997 uh, for testing for publication bias in meta-analyses called uh, Egger regression. Uh, and in this, what, what you do here is rather like this figure, but you, but you rather than force this through the origin, of course, what your assumption is that when the, when the variant doesn't lower cholesterol at all, it doesn't influence coronary heart disease. But rather than uh, force, the, force it through the origin, you let the intercept float. And, and what happens is the intercept is an estimate of the overall pleiotropic effect. But your beta, your regression uh, coefficient, this is the effect of the SNPs on cholesterol, this is the effects on coronary heart disease, your beta just remains a complete, a valid predictor of the causal effect. And you can relax the no pleiotropy assumption. All, the, all your variants can be invalid instruments. You relax it from no pleiotropy as your assumption to the assumption that there is not a, a correlation between the pleiotropic effect and the effect on LDL cholesterol. The strength of the pleiotropic effect and the strength of LDL cholesterol. Uh, should not uh, um, don't correlate. If those don't correlate, then even if all your instruments are invalid, this allows prediction uh, of effects. I'll skip this bit, but but that, that just but it works with LDL cholesterol and works with lots of others. And there's there's other methods. There's the weighted median instrument approach, mode-based estimator, LASU, MR, uh, I squared maximization, echo regression, etc. Uh, so those of you who can't like me find it difficult to maintain eye contact, I can give you. References for these methods later, but they, they all allow a different set of assumptions. So the weighted median, your assumption has to be that 50% of your instruments are valid, which is a completely different assumption than the, the no, no correlation between your pleiotropic effect and your uh, direct effect and, and, and your effect on your risk factor. So, so all of them have a different set of assumptions that you can relax. And so if you, if you use all the methods, then you have to have a very particular situation that would actually generate the same answer uh, for all the methods uh, through pleiotropy. You can uh, interact uh, in a situation where you have a, a known environmental factor that, uh, that, that relates to your genotype. You can interact your genotype with uh, a predictor of that factor on the assumption that if there's pleiotropic effects, then the, uh, of the genotype, then you should see it, that you'd see those effects, whatever the level of the exposure is. So this is a genetic variant related to alcohol consumption, uh, common in East Asian uh, populations, ALDH2, uh, knockout, um, acetaldehyde level goes up when you drink. Uh, acetaldehyde uh, gives you in cartoon uh, form, gives you all the uh, nasty effects of alcohol. You get palpitations, you get headache, you get flushing, you get guilt. Actually, you don't get guilt, but you do get all the other things that are nasty about, uh, about alcohol. Uh, and, 
in, in the East Asian populations, when we carried, met, met, did this meta-analysis, women are just not drinking whatever their genotype. You know, the, the women don't drink independent of genotype, but the men are drinking. So, so we, we, we just separated the analysis by males and females, and in men, carrying a variant related to not drinking was associated with considerably lower blood pressure. Uh, this, is, this, by the way, is the... This is a common variant which will have the, the largest, no other variant has anything like this effect on blood pressure. It was not found in GWASs in East Asian populations because they just use the standard uh, European uh, Illumina chip or, uh, or AFI chip. It did not tag ALDH2 nor variant. Uh, but uh, it's the strongest effect on, on blood pressure. And it works entirely through the environment. So the strongest genetic effect on blood pressure works entirely through an environmental factor, which is alcohol. But, the, but this can't be pleiotropy because the women who aren't drinking, if it was pleiotropy, if the effect wasn't through alcohol, the women would show the same difference in blood pressure. The women don't. This is 2008. We've since done this on 100,000 people. Uh, hopefully soon to be out, and it's, it's exactly the same on, on 100,000 uh, people uh, vote. So there's, uh, you could also have reintroduced confounding through linkage disequilibrium, which you study in the same way as pleiotropy. Reintroduced confounding through population stratification, you deal with that in the standard way. This is something where the Hunt study can be really helpful, is you can get reintroduced confounding through dynastic effects. And by dynastic effects, we mean you get your genetic variants from your parents, and they don't just hand down uh, you know, genetic variants. So if you have a genetic variant, for example, that relates to drinking, then if, if, the, if the women uh, carrying that variant drink in pregnancy, then you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get the variant, but you're also going to get the damaging effects of drinking in pregnancy, so-called dynastic effects. So you can get family-level confounding. So between siblings, so the way to address this is to do Mendelian randomization between sibling mRNA. You, you, know, you need large samples of siblings, uh, and they're only just coming about, but Hunt, for example, was one of the, one of the studies which could con contribute uh, to that. Uh, you get a developmental compensation uh, uh, oh, oh, I'll talk about it. Uh, uh, it, it could also be an issue, i.e., if people have a, you know, genetic, get the genetic variant at conception, it's there right the way through development, early fetal development, and, uh, and during development you could compensate for that genetic uh, difference, which means that you respond differently uh, uh, to the perturbation of the phenotype that it causes. Uh, and this complexity of effects, in, in, in many cases, you actually need to know something essentially about the biology of your intermediate phenotype. Uh, to understand what to understand uh, the causal uh, pathway, and of course there's low statistical power and publication bias, as in all studies. Now, I've got about four more minutes. Do you want should I stop, or should I do four more minutes? Are you sure? Yeah, Feel free. If you get me, just walk. If you're bored, honestly, I'm, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't. I was going to say I don't get offended, so it's okay. So just leave. Okay. So I'm just going to finish by. Um, by uh, running through uh, a, a setup that we've been developing in the unit called uh, MR Base or Mr. Base, which is a sort of semi automated Mendelian randomization uh, uh, platform. And uh, the example I'll give is looking at effects of uh, cholesterol lowering drugs. So you think about on and off target effects. You have a drug, uh, uh, you know, which, which may have agent specific uh, effects, and in the gene, it would be pleiotropic effects. You have a mechanism, which might, and there might be mechani mechanism effects, and then you have the downstream phenotype, uh, where, uh, which is the biomarker you're interested in, and then the targeted disease. It's easier to understand that. If you look at a particular example, you know, statin and HMG co-reductase genotype mimic each other. So there's agent, those are the agent-specific level. HMG co-reductase is the mechanism they work through. Now, it, it, it could be that H, HMG co-reductase manipulating that has effects, which is not through LDL cholesterol. And then you have the LDL cholesterol, uh, and then you have the coronary heart disease as your outcome. Or uh, PCSK9 inhibitors versus PCSK9 genetic variation. Again, the mechanism is through PCSK9, influences LDL cholesterol, CHD, or azetamibe and neiman pick like protein the mechanism which relates to uh, cholesterol absorption in the gut uh, and, and then the mechanism is through the, the protein and then the downstream phenotype or biomarker or target if you like is ldl cholesterol which is thought to be the causal factor so you can separate out whether these whether these drugs are having the, the or they're all having the same effect because of their effect on ldl cholesterol or as uh, some people argued you know this statin exceptionalism you know statins do even better than they should 
which is probably a. a oh, I'll, I'll, I'll say about that. that. <laughs> <laughs> not true. It's probably not, it's probably not true. Okay, so 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 this is about this is about six months old now. So that's a, I, and I didn't update the slide. I'm sorry. So there's rather more data in it now, but the MR base just as a database of harmonised summary genetic data. So you do all these Mendelian randomization analyses through what's called two sample MR, where where your genetic variant. Uh, intermediate phenotype or, uh, associations established in one sample and then you test them in a second sample where you have the disease outcome data. The advantage of that, one, one advantage of two sample MR is that the bias is towards the null. Yeah, in, in a single sample Mendelian randomization, weak instrument bias, etc. leads to bias towards the observational effect. In two sample MR, the bias is towards the null, so it's conservative, which is uh, always uh, is generally quite nice. Um, so anyway, so this, 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 is, this is how the setup was in terms of diseases, risk factors, metabolites, immune traits, and other, bio, other biomarkers. This has increased quite uh, dramatically. And it automates the implementation of a variety of MR analytical techniques and strategies. Uh, this, this will be hopefully going live sometime in September, August or September. But the three, it, the three people who visited Bristol from Hunt recently, I think you got a demonstration, didn't you? So, so it could have been like the um, Wizard of Oz. I could have been behind the curtain, you know, putting up the, <laughs> putting up the numbers. But, but uh, uh, so you could talk to them about, uh, about seeing this in action. This is, what, this is what you see. You enter your exposure data. You define your exposure using your own file. If you have your own variants related to selenium or whatever, you just input, you, uh, input them that, there. You, uh, the, the, this is the information you require, you, or you could use the GWAS catalog to define your exposure, and you define, your, uh, and here's defining the exposure using the GWAS catalog, LDL cholesterol is your exposure, you get the variants that come out of the latest uh, GWAS for uh, LDL cholesterol, and the weights from there. You then define your methods, so you can say you want egg regression, you want weighted median, etc., which sensitivity analyses you want. You then prune the SNPs to be uh, independent, Choose the analysis uh, method, and then oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty. That was pretty good. <laughs> so I really was being boring. <laughs> I, I, I mean, even even the screen got bored. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, honestly don't don't reset it. I was um, I, well, I was. Uh, I was just going to say you press submit, and then <laughs> now no one's going to believe me. I was just going to say you press submit, and the results come up, which is what you, which is what you do. Uh, uh, it's, it's not. I'll. So uh, anyway, what you what, what you see when you press submit is you see that uh, that with all the different methods, you get basically the same predicted effect size of the LDL cholesterol does indeed uh, increase the risk of um, of coronary heart disease. Um, and uh, what I was then going to go on to show is that, is that, is that, is that you can then, and what is uh, you know, pharmacotherapeutic uh, interest is you can then look at the genetic variant that's proxying for your drug. And you see that HMG reductase does relate to a lower risk of coronary heart disease, but it relates to a higher waist hip ratio, higher body mass index, higher risk of type 2 diabetes, all of which are seen in trials. And then you look at across 141 uh, other outcomes like cancers where people have you know, made claims that uh, statins increase your risk of cancer or decrease your risk of cancer. Absolutely no effect on any cancers, no effect on, on uh, psychological traits. You must remember those stories that statins make you commit suicide and all those sort of things. No effect on depression, etc, etc. And there's 141 uh, traits we looked at in relation to, um, to that. And I say it picked out the one you know, the, the, the side effect which has been identified in randomized controlled trials as well as Mendelian randomization studies, which is uh, type 2 diabetes and the small increase in body weight, you actually see in the Mendelian randomization study. And then, and then we compare, you know, the azetamibe and the PCSK9 uh, pathways. We just have to wait till those papers come out. Well, the PCSK9 one is ours, and another group have done the azetamibe one. So then I was going to put up, up a slide which said, uh, my last slide. So that did, that did get me through that very quickly. That was, that was, that was a good trick. Uh, I'm sure there's a, there's a, you've got a foot, foot pedal where you press, the, you press it, and that, 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 just go, that just goes. The next time it'll just be a sort of bucket of water will just, <laughs> will just come down on me. Uh, so I, so I, 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 I just wanted to give a few things which I think will be what, you know, why the Hunt study uh, is you know, particularly attractive with uh, from, you know, Mendelian randomization is the between-sibling Mendelian randomization, which is protected 
from dynastic effects. I think for that, I think you know, th th there's efforts going on to put together a sort of consortium of studies with siblings, so you can do between sibling studies as another sensitivity uh, analysis. The parent offspring Mendelian randomization is, is really quite exciting for in investigating maternal, including potentially intrauterine effects. A recent paper in JAMA uh, 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 was looking at that in relation to maternal glucose, triglycerides, lipids, etc. What are the effects of those on birth weight of offspring? Other such parent offspring studies have shown that have suggested that maternal drinking during pregnancy is associated with adverse effects in the offspring, even at low levels of maternal drinking. You see. Uh, reductions in IQ, which is the opposite of the observational effects, because you know, in, in uh, my study, Alspach, you know, it was the middle class mums who drank half a, in 1991 who were drinking half a glass of Chardonnay a day, and their kids were doing better. And in fact, you got stories came out of those sorts of studies, not of Alspach because we stopped them doing it, but uh, saying you know, um, moderate alcohol consumption when pregnant, you know, it's good for your kids, which it isn't. Mendelian randomization studies shows rather dramatically opposite effects. So that's really, you know, that's really exciting being able to do the sort of cross-generational MR. Uh, in instruments generated for as yet uninstrumented or poorly instrumented phenotypes, because there's, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, exposure data uh, for which there's not yet good instruments. And there are ways of actually, uh, even without genome-wide uh, significant hits, uh, if, you, if, you, if you know from other approaches, you know, G uh, heritability estimates from twin studies or your own GCTA heritability, whatever, if you know the trait is heritable, you know that on average, you know, the, 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 the variants with the, 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 which show the um, statistically most largest effect, even though it's not genome-wide significant, if you put together a thousand of those, they're going to contain some variants that are real. There are ways of combining your variants. You use the I-squared maximization version of egg regression, avoids pleiotropy, and you can actually get, uh, you can start doing MR even when you haven't got identified genetic variants. Sounds like magic. Yeah, but, but uh, it's possible. Uh, and MR and endpoints with limited data from other sources through record linkage, which I think is one of the <coughs> powerful potentials. And MR and progression of disease from, the re uh, from repeat surveys and linkage data, which I think is, the, is the, you know, the, the thing which is most missing, is we just don't have data on disease progression, uh, which is what we'd need to actually be, uh, be able to use Mendelian randomization to say anything reliable about uh, treatment effects. So that's my last slide. But one, uh, you heard that we've got three posts, hopefully, between uh, Bristol and uh, Norway. And we've got, we've got, for people who don't want to be in Norway at all, we've got, we've got posts that are just based in Bristol, uh, <laughs> where it never rains. That's true, isn't it? Paul's, Paul spent six months in Bristol. Didn't, did it rain on a single day? No, never, never rains in Bristol. Uh, and, but you've just got to make the, the results significant. That's the only requirement for the job. Um, in fact, the word significant is banned in Bristol. We, we, we wrote a paper in 2001 saying why uh, the word significant should not be allowed to be used in papers. So, uh, uh, and that's, that, those are the people who did all the work. Uh, so thanks.